Thank you, Pastor George. Good morning. Uh, it really fe- good noon na pala. It feels really great to be here because I remember when I was in freshman college there in UP, I used to attend this church. If I remember it right, this was the very first church that I attended to when I really became a Christian through Campus Crusade. So uh, it's my first time to stand here in the morning service. to give this message, but it really feels like a connection to my conversion days. So thank you for having me. And I'd like to really have special thanks for Pastor George. It's not easy. Uh, Sexual redemption is a kind of ministry that really have a very high casualty because it's attended with so much shame and most of us would rather hide and we just put up a uh, pious, de- devout face that we are doing okay in the church. But when it comes to our struggle, especially in the areas of relationships and sexuality, we hide. And so it's very rare for a church to embrace the kind of ministry that we do and say, we are not only giving lip service to it, we are signing up for it. And so I honor Pastor George and his team for really building a healing team here in CCBC. That tells me that this church is really serious, not just to do his works, but to humbly yield and submit himself on the broken parts and discover God's strength in our weakness. Now, before I begin my talk, I'd just like us to, uh, to invite the presence of the Father to really come to us. Father, thank you that you are our Father and we are your sons and daughters. That we are not orphans, we are not illegitimate, we belong to you and you, you are our Father. I ask that that powerful reality will really be true and will be felt not just known by our heads, but really be felt by our hearts. Lord, come and have a mighty visitation among your children and let the affection and the love that you really want for us to experience really be heartfelt today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to uh, meet my son. Uh, That was taken when he was just... uh, newly born, and behind the smiles of both the father and the son is a story of pain and agony. You know what happened was, uh, I was waiting in the delivery room, and the doctor, the uh, ob came out, and she said, you have to sign this waiver, because his heartbeat is plummeting so rapidly, and In not so many words, she's saying, he may not make it. Mm. And that scared the hell out of me because I I could not imagine my son gone. Because, you know, just a little flashback for many years. You know, I felt insecure as a man. I felt inadequate as a man. I felt uh, like... I, it, I don't have it in me. I don't have what it takes to be a husband and to be a father. And so when the Lord renounced all those lies that I believe about myself and the father really fought for me, uh, which is another backstory of giving me a wife and this child, I could not accept that he will be gone because prior to that, uh, my father said, oh, looks like you won't have a kid or something like that because my brother uh, has been having one child after another and when I got married, my brother even had a daughter before me. And so, you know, in his own brand of uh, sarcasm, my father would say, oh, maybe in the Mukaya or something like that. And so, but the Lord told me, no, you're going to have a son. I'm going to make you a father, not just to uh, experience what it's like to be a father, but I want you to experience 
the kind of the father, heart of a father that I have towards your son. And so, when the doctor told me that, that he may die, I could not accept it. I left the hospital and looked for a place that's private and quiet, like a dungeon, and I really bargained before God. Lord, you can take everything I have, but please do not take away my son. You can, you, I, the ministry is yours. I was leading a ministry. I was just newly appointed as a director of Living Waters. You can have it all. You can have it all, but please do not take away my son. In my heart, it's like a joke giving him to me, and then, hindi ko pa siya nayayaka, but kukunin mo na siya. And so I really cried, and I wept, and I bargained before God for him not to take my son. And then after that, my heart was quieted. I had peace. And that even though I never heard from the doctors again yet, my heart was at peace. And then I went back uh, to the doctor. I saw my son behind that. He was put in a, uh, some kind of an incubator or a, like, a, like a critical nursery room. And just to see my son with all kinds of contraption attached to his body really broke my heart. But the doctor told me, you know what, I don't know what happened. But your son began to respond. You know, when he was born, he did not cry. Uh, nothing, there was silence because he might have already eaten his poo inside the womb. And so, but he's now out of danger. He's now good. He's okay. And I just felt that the Lord fought for me and teach me how to fight for my son. And that's not the first and the last that I uh, fought for my son. That's not the last. I mean, that's not the last. Because I kept on fighting for him, especially in occasions where he would feel discouraged, he would feel down, or he would feel powerless. I remember just last year, when his grades uh, went down and his, he, was, he felt after taking the exams that he was going to fail in most, if not in all of his exams. And he told me, Papa, I'd like to, to die. I, I don't think I would make it in the exams. And I, I really got scared because I was hearing a lot of suicide cases among kids. And so I said, no, no, it's all right. Um, his mother and I assured him, it's all right, even if you fail, our love for you will not fail. We are going to be for you. And I kind of repented for having pressured him to do well. It's like he's like my trophy kid and I wanted him to excel in his academics. And I said, no, pressure off. It's all right, even if you don't make it in your exams. We are going to be there for you. And I spoke to the principal. I talked to his teachers. And we all rallied behind him together. And so it turned out his fears were baseless. That he did not only pass the exams. He really did well. And it was so well that just last March... Oh... Just last March, he graduated at the top of his class. That he graduated with first honors. And, which is a miracle in itself because in his school, he, was, he just joined the school two years ago. And the one who was there since kinder was the one predicted to be the top of the class. But he made it. And he made it so well. And I was so proud. My, uh, my wife and I were so proud of him. You know, it's kind of strange telling this to you to be fighting for my son because I live not having experienced what it's like being fought for by my father. In fact, my father did not only uh, not fight for me, but he fought against me. Now, again, I'd like to say, again, I want to say this, I am not blaming or dishonoring my father or my parents and my family. 
when I say this to you, uh, I'd like to assure you the Lord has done a beautiful work in healing the hurts in my family. But before I, even I could tell you the hurts, I have to tell you, uh, the healing rather, I have to tell you how I was wounded and what the Lord did in healing those wounds. And so it is in that spirit that I'm sharing it to you. But all of these things have been resolved. And so uh, I felt that I am defective. I felt I was not wanted by my father. I remember when my younger brother and I were fighting over a uh, toy gun. The way my father settled it was, wag ka nang makipag-away dyan sa kapatid mo. Manika naman yung gusto mo. Sa kanya na yan. Mm -mm. And I didn't have any language with it, but I was feeling like I am less of a boy. My brother is the real boy here. And perhaps that's, that's one of the factors why I st struggled so much later on with same-sex attraction. I, I felt so insecure about my manhood. I felt so inadequate. I don't measure up with being other men. The spirit of rejection in me, and there's still residue with that up to this day, was very, very strong that when I would uh, speak like this in a crowd, for instance, and I would see somebody like yawning, oh my gosh, I am not making any sense. I am not connecting. So, but don't worry if you yawn, I won't take it against you. <laughs> so, or when my friends would invite our mutual friends to go out and I won't be invited, I would feel like they don't like me or I am not desirable. I am no longer part of this barcado or this friendship. Uh, it's like I have this inner voice that tells me I am less, I am defective, I am not good. And so, because I grew up with a father who really did not fight for me, I did not hear his voice telling me, you can do this, you're good. I did not hear that. I did not feel I'm good before him. The very first man in my life, I felt did not feel good about me as his son. And so, I was insecure being with other men. And yet, the Lord ended all those lies that I was believing about myself and the others were telling about me. Uh, I don't have all the time to share to you the story, but the Lord, in His loving mercy, intervened. I would be in a congregation like this. I would be in a church like this, but I would have two persona. Uh, one is the pious, religious, uh, victorious, born-again Christian, but the other one is having a reckless sexual lifestyle. And I managed somehow to be functional for two decades doing that. But the Lord would not have none of that. He loved me too much not to live my life in that duplicity. And he, what, one of the things he used in fighting for me and to end a life of a lie and to live a life of integrity is living waters. Wala pa hong living waters doon sa Pilipinas. He brought me to Thailand where there was a living waters conference. And there I heard the father speaking to me almost like an audible voice that the very thing that you are so shameful about, about yourself, these inner struggles that you've been trying to shoot down and just trying to put up a pious front because that, that's what you feel you're serving self, your ministry self, you feel is the one that would make you qualified and accepted in the church. That's not what I want from you. I want your heart. That's where I want to enter in. The most shameful things that you feel less about yourself is the very thing that I want to come into your life. I've never heard that kind of truth being spoken to me. And so, to be loved in your unlovable parts. It's all right to be loved on our strengths, on our credentials, on our giftings, on what is celebrated among us. That's just what human beings do. But to be loved in our broken parts, to be loved 
in the parts that you feel are unlovable about you and to be loved in the parts that you have been cutting off from yourself is to be loved indeed. And that's how the Father fought for me, to be loved in my unlovable parts. And so, dahil minahal niya ako sa aking mga maduduming bahagi ng buhay ko, natuto akong lumaban, even fighting for my son. And that story of the fighting father began at the cross. That's where the greatest story of fighting was ever told. No? And I love our country because in this secular age, in this age, especially, the irony is, in the most developed of countries, that's where they are eliminating God. Hmm. Like in the West or in North America, where they would try, in the name of political correction, remove anything that even suggests of God, uh, tearing down the Ten Commandments statue, tearing down any image that will say of Jesus Christ, I am so proud of our nation that still erect uh, things of the Lord and a towering symbol of the power of God that is the cross. And at the cross, it's all right, you can clap. <laughs> and there at the cross, that's where the fighting happened because we were all orphans. We were all have doubts about ourselves. We all have a sense of like illegitimate that if I don't work hard enough, nothing will happen in my life. If I don't figure it out for myself, no one else would. I have to secure my own turf. I have to have my own home. I have to really work hard. Otherwise, I will die a poor man. And that is uh, the spirit of an orphan who feels there is no father who will provide for him, there is no father who will secure him, there is no father who will prepare a good life for him. And so, because at the cross, we became free from that slavery and we became sons and daughters, that we can truly be called sons and daughters because there is the cross. And there at the cross, <clears throat> there is the divine union. You know, I want you to picture the Son, even now, seated at the right hand of the Father. The author of love, you know, love did not come from all these feel-good movies or romantic novels. Love came, and love came from love himself. And that is our God the Father. And who in creating this world, in creating us, had nothing in his heart but love. Everything. It might be functional for us. It might be working well for us. It might be good for us. But that is not based on functionality or efficiency. That is all based on love. And so this God of love is enjoying this perfect relationship with the Son. Everything that He created and formed is for the Son. And the Son does nothing except in honor and in love for the Father. They have a perfect communion. There is nothing defiling. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing lacking in their relationship. It's a perfect bliss. We could only have a glimpse of that. No? And yet, there's something about that love that heaven is not enough for the Father without us. I cannot fathom, I cannot explain the kind of love He has for us, that even heaven is not enough for Him if we are not going to enjoy that love with Him. And so, He knew that the only way he, we could be united with Him in His perfect love for us is to send the, His most beloved, most beloved Son unto earth to be with us. And that means even dying to the cross. You know, the most painful separation of all our relationships, it is not a separation between a teacher and a student or between a discipler and a disciple. The most painful separation is between the father and the son. 
You know, maybe some of you know this Barbara Walters, who has been hosting uh, CNN, uh, public affairs program. She said that after decades of interviewing dignitaries, the presidents and heads of state, the ambassadors, really the who's who of the world, she said, of all my interviews, of the, if there's only one subject that would always, without fail, would make my interviewees break down in tears, it's when they talk about their fathers and the pain of separation from their fathers. <clears throat> there is something intrinsic. There is something in our hearts that we are created to really long for something much superior than us, much bigger than our dreams, much greater than our fondest hopes, that only the strong arms and the prodigal love of a prodigal father could give. And so, kung nasaktan si Jesus na nahiwalay kay Father, I tell you, we have no idea of the pain and the agony it caused the Father to be separated from His Son. And so there is that divine suffering that both the Father and the Son experience. So there is a divine separation. And from that separation, there is a divine pain. There is a divine uh, suffering. Imagine this. The broken heart of the father away from his son. And the broken body crucified on the cross of the son. These two, the broken heart and the broken body, released a river flowing mercies to flow unto the broken parts of our hearts the one that's aching, the one that's in pain, the one that is lonely, the one that is in despair. The river of mercy from the broken heart of the Father, from the broken body of Jesus, flow into these parts. And so, there is no pain that is deeper where that mercy is not deeper still. There is no loneliness that is so aching that that river of mercy cannot go even deeper. We are so privileged and honored to partake in our sufferings in the suffering of the Father and the Son separated from one another. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how he will not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. If he could give up his son for us, what else will he not give for us? Of course, we know that is not the end of the story. You know, that there is a divine reunion that happens. Okay, as you can see, I'm not so techy. There, the divine reunion. Yes, the father and his son reunited in resurrection and the reunion paved the way for us to become the heavenly father's sons and daughters. In the same way that our suffering is not unto despair, is not unto anguish, but is unto hope because the pain and the crucifixion the death of Jesus Christ could not be contained by the tomb, could not be kept inside the grave. He rose up, and in his resurrection, we rose up with him, and we got reunited with the Father. With the resurrection of Christ, with, the, with Jesus joining, reuniting with the Father, when they got together, the sons and daughters, us, 
being resurrected from the death of that orphan spirit, we join the Father with Jesus as our brother. And together with Jesus, the spirit in us that yearns for a father comes out that says, Abba, Father. And we can truly call the God the Father our Father. And that happens in this divine reunion. And so that is the complete work of the cross. The cross declares that the resurrected life the Father fights for us to live is more powerful than the blackest of our sins and brokenness. His mercy is beyond what our minds can understand. And I want you to picture this fighting Father because it did not only happen at the cross, it was foreshadowed at uh, in the Old Testament. No? You know, the Israelites, when the Lord showed to them the promised land, the land that was uh, prepared by the Lord for them, but when they saw that the men they perceived at least were taller than them, when they saw that they were stronger than them, when they saw that the city seemed to be have more grandeur than them, they got scared. They got afraid. Suddenly, they did not want to enter the land the Lord had for them. And uh, they forgot altogether the miracles that they were taken out of slavery in Egypt. And the Lord performed beautiful, powerful miracles like journeying with them in the wilderness. The Lord's presence, really, coming with them as like a pillar of fire and manna from above as their bread for their food. They don't even have to doil the Lord giving it to them directly from heaven. And yet, when they saw something that they perceived greater than them, they got afraid. They even forgot the parting of the Red Sea and the Lord creating a dry land in the middle of the sea where they would walk so the Egyptians led by the Pharaoh could not pursue them. But Moses, in their fear, told them in Deuteronomy 1, 29 to 31, Do not be afraid of the enemy. The Lord your God who is going before you will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt, before your very eyes and in the desert. There you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries a child. All the way you went until you reached this place. The fighting father assured them, I'm not only going to tell you where you're going. I'm not only going to give you your destination or a road map. I am going to journey with you and fight each of the enemies that you are going to encounter along the way. I'm going to feed you. I'm going to prepare a pathway for you. I'm going to sustain you. Everything that you need for this journey, it's on me. That's how... The Father fought for them, and that's how the Lord continues to fight for us, fighting our battle in our behalf. No? And Moses also said them in Exodus 14, 13, and 14, he says, Do not be afraid, stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. The scripture does not say, uh, the Lord will fight for you. Get your weapons, get your ammunition, get your armaments. No. Be still. Be still. It's in stillness where, as the psalmist said, when we get to know that He is God indeed. Because it's in stillness, we see Him. In stillness, we experience Him. In stillness, we get to see Him fighting for us. So it's not our striving, it is not our efforting, it's the silencing of the noises in our hearts. The noises that say, no, I'm not good enough. No, I'm going to be rejected. No, I cannot fight this battle. I don't have it in me. No, I'm not going to make it. No, I am not intelligent, brave, courageous enough. I don't have enough connection. And the Lord is saying, shh, silent. Be still. Don't listen to these noises. Only listen to me. And that's how the battle 
begins. And the Lord is the beginning point, the middle point, and the end point of our battles. So, ano ba ang itsura ng fighting father? What does a fighting father look like? No? It will be good to see how the father fathers our Lord Jesus Christ because that's how he wants to father us as his sons and daughters. And in Luke 3.22, you know, it's interesting that after Jesus' birth, we don't get to hear a lot about what happened in his childhood except in the account in Luke where when he was uh, a kid, he really impressed the scribes when he could really talk of the plan of God and the scriptures. No? But other than that, the rest of the Gospels have no account of how the childhood life of Jesus. And yet, when he was 30 years old, at the beginning of his ministry, uh, when John the Baptist was baptizing him, the heavens opened, and in Luke 3.22, Luke wrote, and the Holy Spirit descended in a bodily form like a dove, and it fell upon him, and a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. The message version of the Bible says, You are my Son, chosen and marked by my love, pride of my life. Remember, the Father said this in public with so much pride for His Son, Jesus Christ, before He could do any ministry, before, before He could do any miracle, before He did any great and mighty works in the name of the Father. The Father told Him, You are my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Yung, yung pleasure ni God sa Kanya did not come from His accomplishments. The pleasure of God in Him is because He is beloved, just because He is there, just because He exists, just because He is God's begotten Son. And that is the core of His identity. It's not His position, it's not His title, it's not what He could deliver and what He could work on. It's not the accolades of men, it's not the praises of those high and mighty in power, it's what God tells him who he is. And that is God's beloved, beloved son. Not dutiful, obedient son. Not hardworking son. Beloved son. And it's coming from the heart of the father. <clears throat> and so we can see here, and the sequence that followed, you know, uh, he was tempted after that. So the Spirit led him. He was, after the Father declared he is God's beloved, he was filled with the Spirit and he was ready to face the temptation. Uh, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. He was tempted by the enemy and he did not only survive the temptations, he overcame them. In all of that, he quoted the scriptures and he triumphantly and victoriously defeated all the suggestions and hints of the enemy to forget the Father's business and just have glory of the enemy. And then after that, after he was tempted, and in that temptation he was cleansed, he was purified, uh, he was really went through the fire and he came out of the fire clean he was tempted, but he did not sin. And then after that, that's when he did the works. That's when he did the miracles. That's when he caused the lame to walk, caused the blind to see, and the deaf to hear. And that's when he did the great works. Some, and we could see here, even the sequence in the gospel, ang nangyari sa kanila, ay, there's defining, refining, and empowering. So that's what the, a father does. He defines us. He tells us 
who we are. Parang sa Lion King, remember who you are. And it would come from the Father. And then, refining us. Uh, not, you know, many of us, we would like the softness and the kindness and the gentleness of the love of the Father. But, and that is good. And the Father gives us to us sweet affection. But this affection is not soft and is not weak. It is a love that is strong. It is love that can make you withstand difficulties. It is love that can make you take risks. It is love that can make you venture out into unknown territories without fear because you have been loved and you know you're in good hands. And so you go through the fire knowing that you are going not to be burned. You can go through deep waters and you know you are not going to be drowned. That's what the Father does. He does not just confine us into the safety of our home. Uh, our mother can be, uh, is anointed to nurture us and to give us the, the safety of home. But the Father's voice is the one that calls us out that there is a beautiful world outside your home and I want you to conquer it. And by that to happen, He has to refine us. And the other thing that the Father does is empowering us. So by empowering us, there's something about the voice of the Father that really shore up something in a child and he gets to do it. The voice of the Father that says, you can do it, becomes the child's, I can do it. You know, the mother's really good in uh, taking care and in nourishing. But it is the Father's voice that is really anointed to really empower and strengthen. You know, a little girl, when she wears a beautiful dress, a mother will say, wow, you're so beautiful in the dress. But there's something that is incomplete about that. But when the Father, oh, baby, you look so beautiful in the dress, and then she gets it. No? And by the way, studies show that uh, little girls who grew up not being adored by their first man in their lives, who are their fathers, who said, you are beautiful and don't let anyone else say that you are not, they end up vulnerable, moving from one bed to another with men because their ears are itching to hear, you are beautiful, and even if it means going to bed and have sex with a man who's seducing him, so this one her and trying to fool her, they are going to do it because their hearts are yearning to hear that they are beautiful and that should have been said by the fathers. And so that's what a father does, defining us. Who we are will not come from media, will not come from culture, even our identity on who we are as man and as a woman. You know, in this age where a child, especially in again, in the developed world, developed world will say, I can choose my gender. I can choose to be a man by morning, to be a woman by afternoon, and to be transgender by the evening. I can choose my gender. It does not come from us. It comes from the one who created us, who said that I created you male, I created you female, and together, male and female, you bear my image that is the one who alone has the power and the right and the love to tell us who we are. And he tells us our identity as beloved sons and daughters. And so, just like what he did in fathering Jesus Christ, his son, he defines him and then he refines him and then he empowers him to do the works that the Lord already prepared for him to do. For most of us, it got to be inverted. It's like uh, we grew up with fathers who, when our, high, when our grades are high, he shows affection to us. He's proud of us. But when our grades are down or when we mess things up, uh, he frowns on us or even would feel bad about us or would even say painful or harsh things about us. And that's what I would like to discuss with you next, uh, the way we've been wounded by our Father. No? 
for many of us, uh, we grew up that we didn't experience that kind of defining. This is who you are. You can do it. Anak, ang galing-galing mo sa math. So, this is going to be an, like a laboratory for engineers. Ang galing-galing mo sa science. So, I will create a clinic or a hospital for you. You will be a great doctor. Most of us, perhaps, we did not hear that kind of empowerment or we did not hear that kind of defining us. At what we heard instead are hurting words like, Buti pa yung kuya mo, matalino. Ikaw ang hina-hina mo. Or ang bobo mo. Or but, but, yung ate mo maputi. Ikaw ang negra mo. You, come you are not as pretty as your uh, elder sister or your ate. For some of us, instead of words that will really build us up and would really believe, give us the confidence and shore us up, we heard words that are painful from our fathers. I know this is not your uh, typical message of a uh, Father's Day, mm -hmm. oh, but once we get to be in touch with the way we have been wounded by our earthly fathers, all the more we are going to experience uh, the healing of the fighting love of our Heavenly Father. You know, if I could summarize the wounds of the fathers, of our earthly fathers, they can be in two types. One is neglect. This kind of wound is hard to detect because it is the absence of what we did not get. We are supposed, our fathers are supposed to empower us, but he was silent, he was quiet, and did not really encourage us and affirm us on who we are and what we can do. Or perhaps the fathers are, decide, are designed to provide for us, really, literally, to provide food on the table, to send us to school, but perhaps our father did not work or was a bum or left us for another family, and so we were left with having to provide for ourselves. And we grew up feeling, unless I work hard, I would go hungry. And that is, again, the spirit of an orphan, of not having security that he has a father who will provide for him. Or perhaps our father is physically present, but he's not connecting with us. It's as if we don't exist. He might be coming from work. He might be very busy on work six days a week. And on weeknights, he is so tired, he would just sit down in front of the television set, would read the papers, but would not even us, me, I did not grow up being us. Anak, kamusta ka na? Ano nangyayari sa school nyo? Wala ko narinig. I did not hear words like that. And perhaps for some of you, you, even though you did not have words for it, you long to have an emotional connection with your fathers, but you did not feel it. So that's neglect. Or you did not feel uh, how it's like to be hugged, to be embraced by your own father and Studies show it is not something we can rationalize with, oh, well, my father or my family is not demonstrative, just, just that the way it is, we are not the hugging type. No, uh, our bodies are designed to really receive hug, to really receive non-sexual, affectionate, affirming embrace, especially coming, coming from a father. And if we don't get that, that's a source of a lot of sexual brokenness. But that's another story altogether, but that's also one form of neglect, of not receiving what we should be getting. All right? And then the other type of wound from our earthly fathers is abuse. There is presence, but there is a misuse of that presence. So that could go either a verbal abuse, yung sinasabi ko kanina, saying it's, it's bad enough that we did not hear affirming, encouraging words, but what we heard are words that cut us, sarcastic words that put us down, that we became more aware of what's wrong with us, of what's lacking with us. How many of you, you won't hear your fathers? They are mostly quiet, but once you make a mistake, suddenly he can speak and he can talk, and you could hear him really criticizing you, what's wrong with you, bakit hindi mo 
natapos yung pag-aaral mo, bakit mo magsaka sa grades mo? Especially if what we've done wrong will bring dishonor to the family and our shame-based culture, we are so big deal on that. No. And so, uh, we could experience that kind of abuse, verbal abuse, that we might carry with us uh, that might have formed that inner dialoguing in our mind when we are venturing out into something, we tend to shrink back and say, oh, I cannot do that. I'm old already, or my grades are that high. I'm not really good there. It's hearing uh, from our fathers our limitations, and we sort of internalize that, even when we are no longer children. Or it could be physical abuse. No? I, as sometimes... When we make mistakes, we need to be corrected, but instead of being constructively corrected, uh, we were given a kind of punitive correction. We experience harsh punishment rather than a loving correction. I grew up in a province where you could be put inside a sack, ikukulong ka sa sako, tapos itatali ka sa puno. Or you would be asked na lumuhod sa uh, munggo. Okay? Or, just like what happened to me at the feet of rage of my uh, father, he took his belt and then when, when he was raging all the more, hitting me, he did not only use the leather of the belt, but the buckle of the belt. And I just would just be like a, uh, in a fetus position trying to hide every part of my skin because of the lashing uh, from my father. Perhaps some of you, you were physically hurt when you made mistakes. And you were a kid, you did not know any better. And yet, the punishment given to us uh, was harsh and not proportionate to the offense that was committed as a child. That is physical abuse. Or perhaps you experience emotional abuse when you are the recipient almost every day of criticism and negative words, then your heart really gets broken. And that's emotional abuse. When you think less of yourself, when you become insecure about who you are. And when you feel tentative and inadequate in relating with others. So that's abuse. Or it's an abuse of authority. It's like, don't speak. Everything that I tell you, you have to follow. You know, I grew up in that kind of, uh, like our family line culture, where the elders' words are supposed to be the words of the king. They cannot be bent right or wrong. We need to obey. And there is no room for our feelings or to express our opinions. We do not have our own opinions. And that is an abuse of authority. So those are the two types. of. There are many other woundings that we experience from our fathers, but these are essentially the two types, the neglect and the abuse. No? And the effect of this fatherlessness or wounds from our fathers is powerlessness or settling for less. It's like we have this imaginary ceiling over our head that says, I'm only up to here. I cannot do much. I cannot really be dependent on or relieved either, but I don't want to venture, to venture beyond here. I cannot go beyond my comfort zone. No? And I feel even on a national scale, uh, most of our ills, most of our suffering as a nation uh, is not about poverty. It's about fatherlessness. You know, earlier in the service, Pastor George spoke about really uh, so many families that have no fathers, no? especially in the phenomenon of OFWs. No? As statistics show that majority of our families now, I'm talking here of Filipino families, not American families, are already single-parent families. They are the majority. So a two-parent families is no longer the norm. All right? And so there is so much uh, pain of fatherlessness and lack of guidance. And most of our kids are really getting their cues and their uh, guidance from the internet, from social media, 
from their peers, and from Google, essentially. No? And from people who are going to lead them into a bad pathway. No? <clears throat> and Sons and daughters who live their lives like an orphan, who do not know who they truly are as children of the Father and get their identity from what the media or their friends will say, that has resulted in a people like us who are really hungry for righteous leadership. You know, I, I was a journalist for many years, and I've realized just what one publisher told me, that a water cannot go higher than its source. I thought, as a writer then, as a newspaper man, that this, our country can be changed by the right leaders or really exposing the shenanigans of our congressmen or senators. And I realized that there's nothing in them. There's nothing in them that had been fathered well that can make them say, like a few good men, no, I am not going to... Uh, do that that will bring injustices to my people. No, I am not going to do anything, legislate anything that will oppress my people. No, I am not going anything that will violate the holy standards of God. Uh, if only, and I, have, I know so many stories firsthand, if only, it doesn't have to be a majority, these few good men who are even supposed to be Christians said no to unrighteousness and said yes to God's heart of love and justice for our people, then we would really experience our true heritage and blessing as a nation. And so much of that is rooted not in lacking things, but at the acts of it, at the root of it that needs to be asked is fatherlessness. And our fighting father would like to refather us, no? The Father wants to define us. Uh, hindi what our, the broken fathering that we receive, that we are lampa or mahina or hindi ko kaya yan, that's not who we are. And the Father wants to uh, introduce Himself. You know, our Father has that, you, you might have this phrase, benevolent authority. That is the fusion of uh, tenderness and strength, or the sal salient love. Uh, Psalm 62, verses 11 and 12 says, Power belongs to God. To you, O Lord, belongs mercy. The Father has this beautiful blend of love and strength. Authority with kindness. Not just authority, do this, uh, like despotic, but not only kindness, like softness, but no truth, but benevolent authority. Truth with kindness, like Jesus, uh, grace with truth, full of grace and truth. No? And that's how the Father wants to refather us. So He wants to define us. Coming from Him, uh, He wants to really say our true identity. And that is... Not the lies that have been spoken about ourselves, but we are his beloved son and daughter. We are the co-heir with his son, Jesus Christ. That everything that he created, everything that his son owns, we own them. We are co-heirs of Jesus Christ, and he will not withhold any good thing from us. He loves us, and he wants that love to be experiential for us. And He never intended for us to live an insecure, defeated, fearful lives. He wants us to really live a full, abundant, uh, a life that is full of faith, expectant, that He is a good God who does not want anything but good things for us. And not only to feel good, but to be good. Meaning, Refined by fire, but good. Mm -mm. So, defined by the Father, refined by the Father, and 
envisioned by the Father. No? The wrong choices we've made in our lives and even being in touch with the broken places in our hearts, we might have some, made some reckless choices that made, have made us think, oh, I have bungled it. I, have, I blew it already. There's not much that I can do. I just need to live with these consequences. And we sort of resign to it. We sort of kind of settle for less. And the Father is saying, no, no. What am I God for for you if I'm not going to rescue you from the pit, if I'm not going to redeem the bad choices that you made, if I'm not going to restore what's been eaten by the locusts and give you a double portion of honor to take away the shame. A double portion of honor to take away the shame. That's what our fighting father does for us. So our father breaks the ceiling and makes us fighters in his image. We are only sort of only up to this, but he breaks it and says, uh, move up your head and see the horizon is much bigger, is much wider than you think. And it's beautiful and I want you to conquer it. You're meant for that. You're meant to be really be my core ruler in the dominion of this earth. Mm. So how does the love of the Father look like? Uh, you know, in... There, in John 1.18, sa English Standard Version, it says there, No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. Kolpon, He has made Him known. Okay? You know, uh, English can be very limited in terms of really capturing what the original language, in this case Greek, really wants us to see about the affection of the Heavenly Father towards Christ Jesus. Kolpon here, uh, it means uh, in ESB, Kolpon means bosom, heart, and neck, and not just side. I'd like to call on our volunteer, yes, and one of his sons, si Pastor Randolph, and Michael or Aaron? Michael, all right. So, ano lang to? Maliit na demo? Okay, yes. So, imagine Pastor Randolph as the God the Father, right? And Aaron as Jesus. Upo po, upo kayo. Michael, sorry, Michael, as Jesus. So, uh, Michael, I want you to touch your father's neck. Yes, I want you to touch his bosom. Uh, <laughs> yung chest. Yan. And then yung heart niya. Yan, there. Okay, and then touch his side. 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 Now, yan. Now, I want you to touch all those four together. Sabay sabay. <laughs> See, you cannot. There's only one position you can touch all those simultaneously. I want you to sit at your father's lap. Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, like here, here. And put your head on his. There. Uh, yeah, I want them to see it first. Okay. There. There. So that's how the father is having Jesus sit on his lap at the bosom. No? Or sometimes when you read the scripture, it can be cold and dry, but that's how affectionate the father is. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Really touching the father's heart and bosom and neck and side. No? I don't know about you, uh, up to this day, no, I have yet to have a day where uh, I did not grow up being able to sit on my father's lap and just feeling his body no? and just feeling the warmth or even the heartbeat of his heart. But the father wants that to do for you. No? The father wants to 
to make you not just know, not just study about His love. He wants you to experience it. He wants it to be heartfelt for you. Because only that kind of heartfelt love on fire and alive can make you withstand any onslaught of the enemy, any challenges that will come your way. In fact, that's the only way to live this life of following Jesus. There's no other way. That's how Jesus did it. We cannot do it any other way. It cannot be cold and cognitive concept of the Father's love. It has to be a heartfelt one and really felt one. You know, I just want to uh, share with you that when you live with a father who fights for you, he will restore even your relationship with your own earthly father. You know, I shared to you the kind of abusive words, verbal abuses that I received from my father and even the physical hurt. And I grew up really uh, hating my own father that I did not want him to be my father. I always, I became bent on authority figures. A pastor, a discipler, my small group leader. It's like I was hungry for a benevolent authority. And I was not connecting to my father at all. I did not know that I judged him already. And I disconnected myself from him. Until the Lord spoke to me in one prayer ministry that I cannot experience his love unless I realized and I become my father's son. And so I remember there's this one time where I wrote a letter and I gave it to him and I, I said, sorry, I apologize for the way that I dishonored him, that I judged him, and I spoke ill things against him. And he, I wish I could tell you it's a dramatic moment of my father saying, uh, I also asked for your forgiveness for doing this and that. He did not do that. But I really felt connected to him. And it opened an intimate relationship with my father. You know, most of our fathers, they will not say it. They will do it. They just, uh, my father, uh, it's like the words, I am sorry, it's like 10 load of weight that cannot get out of his lips but he would do it in service. Like he would rather uh, iron my clothes, wash them, and bring my kid to school, or do errands for my wife, do all these things for a day when he feels he has offended me, but would not say the word, I am sorry. But I began to, uh, no longer God has work in my heart not to demand how my father should treat me, not to demand or expect how my father would love him. And you know what the Lord did? Uh, two years ago, uh, in my sabbatical, the Lord gave me the opportunity to fulfill one of the dreams of my father, and that is to be in the U.S. to meet his two brothers that he has never met, met for 40, 50 years already. And he felt before we die, before, because they're already in their 80s. And my father said, I want to see them, but I know I may not get a visa because I've never been to the U.S. And I dreamt for him. And I said, Lord, I want to bring my father to the U.S. and I want to fulfill that dream for him. And the Lord did a miracle. He was granted a visa. He provided the finances. And so he made it. He met his brothers, and they really had beautiful talks. But I even got a special bonus. We got to have really deep talks. You know, when my father and I together, we would talk about other people, which is actually gossip, but we would not talk about ourselves. And we would talk about how wrong the country is or how bad our relative is. But hallelujah to us, we're okay. But... We won't talk about our hearts. But for the first time, my father really began to open up and I learned from him his own painful childhood, how his own father, my great-grandfather, who had all the money, who was a rich businessman, refused 
to spend a single centavo for my father to be sent to school. And my father wanted to study. He wanted to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. And that was painful for him. And so I got to understand him. And I also learned that my father, great-great-grandfather belonged to the, one of the cateponeros of Andres Bonifacio. So much so, one of the soldiers of Andres Bonifacio. So much so that my grand, grandfather named him Bonifacio. That's his name is, Bonifacio. And then I became proud of him. That, oh, that's, this is where I got from you. The instinct in me that is a warrior, or the killer instinct in me that really wants to fight, uh, came from my father. And I began to honor him and love him. And so the Lord, I don't have all the time, began a new work in mercy in my life, not only experiencing what it's like to be loved by our Heavenly Father, to, but to be fought for by Him and to restore me and experience the beautiful inheritance that I have of the Father that the Lord gave me. Okay. So let's pray. I'd like to request you to stand as I pray a Father blessing to you. For most of us, perhaps, while you are listening to this talk, the Lord is bringing painful memories with your own earthly fathers. And the Lord is not bringing them up only just because you are hearing this talk, but the Lord is bringing them up because He wants to heal them. He's not digging them up. You're not digging them up. The Lord is bringing them up. He wants to heal them. For us mortals, we divide our time with past, present, and future. But for the Lord, it's just one plain field of today. Where we are at now is our connection with eternity, where the Father meets us and longs to encounter us. And He wants to revisit even that painful memories of our, the broken fathering that we receive. So I will just invite you, uh, as I lead this prayer, to, to bring our own father wounds, to really name them. Very specific, if it's verbal abuse or neglect or physical abuse, to bring it before the father. And he will be faithful to do a new work of healing in our hearts and in our lives. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are our Father and we are your children. Lord, standing here are your sons and daughters. Wounded by our imperfect fathers. Father, we release to you, we give to you the hurts, the pain. There are specific abuses and neglect that we experience from our fathers. Lord, our hearts are never designed by you to contain them. We cannot hold them in our hearts any longer. They have affected the way we look at ourselves, the way we look at others, and even the way we look at you. Sometimes seeing you as a harsh father because our father is harsh, or as a father with conditional love because our father's love for us is conditional. Father, today we give to you our wounds 
we bring them at the foot of the cross of your son. And with all heads are bowed, I want you to just to speak quietly, releasing each of the wounds that the Lord has shown to your heart. Be specific in the way that you've been hurt by your fathers, by your biological fathers. Lord, come, come. Yes, Lord, come. Yes, Lord, Lord, at the cross, we transact the greatest exchange. The insulting words, the critical words, the words that say we are bobo or lampa or mahina or pangit. Lord, we we renounce them as lies spoken over us. And we exchange them with your powerful truths that you who created us is pleased with everything in us. That you love all parts in us, even in parts that we have a hard time accepting about ourselves. And Lord, we exchange the sting of the hold and the attachment to these painful, hurting words with your words of truth. The words that tell us We are your beloved sons. We are your beloved daughters. That you form us in our mother's womb. That you know the number of our days. And you long to fill those days with your good purposes. And you will accomplish those purposes out of your good and loving heart. that our destiny is to live a good life because we have a good, good Father. A life that is victorious. A life that is not given to our sinful patterns. A life that does not resign and settle for less. And a life that is envisioned by you. for greatness, to be a man for others, to fulfill your divine purposes, to be bringer of the kingdom on earth. Lord, we embrace that destiny for us. And we refuse, we refuse to listen to all the accusations and condemnation of the enemy. We refuse and we pray against any spirit of death. of despair and depression and hopelessness and resignation and we embrace your life abundant life thriving, flourishing good life Father heal us cleanse us from the defilement and from the effects of these wounds of neglect and abuse done against us. Thank you that the brokenness of our Father is not the last word about us. You have the last say about us. That you redeem, you restore our broken broken relationships will be restored. What's been eaten and stolen by the enemy will be restored even a double, triple portion. You are going to do this because you're a God who redeems, because you're a father who fights for your sons and daughters. So, Father, in in your name, I bless this one 
I impart to them the blessing of the Father. I bless your identity as a male and as a female. I bless your being a son and being a daughter. That there is no mistake about that. I bless your sonship. That you are not an orphan. You are not illegitimate. I bless your daughtership. You are not an orphan. You are not illegitimate. You have a father who is for you and fights for you. You have a father who will provides for you and longs for you to feel his generosity. You have a father who wants your life to prosper, not just materially, but your soul to be nourished and to prosper. I bless you with good works that the Father has already set for you to do. That you are not going to do guesswork, figuring it out as if you have no destiny. You have a destiny. You have a place and you will take that place. You are the only one who can occupy that place. And I bless your place. I bless your place in the body of Christ. I bless your place in your workplace. I bless your place in your family. That place is given to you by God. And it's sacred and it is beautiful. I bless that. I bless you with cups that are being filled to the brim. You are not going to settle for less. You are not just going to be barely make it. You are going to have your needs met overflowing, overflowing, overflowing. Because your Father owns the universe. Because your Father controls all things. And He's going to engineer circumstances to create an opening, even creating streams in the desert just to ensure that all your needs are met, that everything that will bring delight to your heart as you delight in Him will be given to you. Even in the presence of your enemies, you will thrive. And even your enemies will have peace with you. I bless you with a life that is full of meaning. Not desolate. Not really guessing what I would do with my life. But full of hope full of direction from above, full of the purposes and the holy strategies that God has for you. I bless you with a, a romantic adventure with the Father. That it will not be same old, same old for you. I bless you with newness of life. It's going to be like a reboot for you. And the scripture that you might have studied will come out alive. The things you would never have thought or imagined, exceeding beyond what all you could think or conceive of, the Lord will give it to you. And it will not just be words. The Father longs to give them to you. So Father, I bless these ones with a new season. A new season of healing. A new season of being the fathered one. The fathered one. The fathered son. The fathered daughter. I bless you with favor. With the favor of God that will cascade into having favor before men. I bless your words to really have the breath and the power of God. That you will be a bringer of encouragement. You will be a bringer of affirmation. That no dead words will emanate from your lips. That you will be a bringer of His presence. That the Father's will on earth will be done here 
earth, uh, God, the Father's will on heaven will be done here on earth through you. You will be carrier of His presence. You will be bringer of His presence. I bless you with that. I bless you of being a bringer of the kingdom wherever you go, wherever you set your foot on. You'll be a bringer of joy. You'll be a bringer of His delight. And I bless you with ears that are inclined to Him. That all condemning, accusing voices will be silenced and will be muted in Jesus' name. And your ears will be alive hearing the very words of God that bring you life, that shore you up, that bring you hope, and that make you fall in love with life. And I bless you with a heartfelt love of the Father. Not just a cognitive knowledge of His love, but really experiential feeling the warmth the affection, even the heat of His loving arms. I pray you with that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Father, you are also our dream giver. I bless you that these new hopes will result in breaking the ceilings that you have set for yourself. Ceilings that might have been set by the limiting words of the brokenness of your father or of your friends. So I bless you with broken ceilings. And to see a, a beautiful landscape, lush, flourishing, where you are called to blossom and to be planted where you are called to blossom. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord, seal these blessings for these sons and daughters. Seal all these prayers, for we pray this in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.